さあダウン
I told him that it took place on this very road and that the girl might be a ghost. Right as I finished that sentence, she looked at me through the rearview mirror with her bright, white eyes and asked us if we were talking about her. My heart dropped once again. We asked the guy to pull over, but he insisted on dropping us off at our location. One of my female friends in the no, car started crying now. after Mary started reciting all of our names from the back of the car. We were scared because we didn't tell her our names. Now everyone in the car was crying except for me. It felt like we were driving forever, but it had only been 10 minutes. It got brighter out, and we realized that no one was in the back. It was a night spirit that was there, and it left because it was now morning. The next morning, I thought about what happened while I was taking a shower. When I looked in the mirror, I saw a scratch on my neck. <sighs> Got five scars. When I was eight years old, I used to live in my grandma's house in Ecuador. Many of the neighbors would talk to my parents about seeing weird stuff in the house, like shadows moving around the windows when we weren't home. The first thing that would come to our heads was that someone must have broken into the house, but nothing would ever be missing. Of course, they didn't think that there was someone breaking in. They were sure that our house was haunted. Everyone even refused to come inside for parties or any other special occasion. They told us to get a priest and to get rid of any bad spirits. We didn't take their warnings as something important because my parents don't believe in those kinds of things. Although I would hear someone going up the stairs at night, our stairs were really old, so they would make a loud sound when someone... Bro, at my dad's old house, I used to hear the same thing sometimes. Step on them. However, when I checked, there was nothing. I would just run to my bed and cover my head with the sheets until I fell asleep. One night, someone started knocking on the door really hard and screaming. We got really scared as it was 12.30 a.m. and everyone was asleep by then in our neighborhood. It was extremely rare that someone would be up at that time. My dad took but his wait, shotgun and told my mom and head? me to stay in my room and not move. I was scared for my dad's safety, but I felt relieved when my dad said my neighbor's name. He informed us that a water pipe had broke in our backyard and the water was spraying his house and broke one of his windows. He was nice about the situation and even said he'd help us fix the pipe. My dad got the shovels as the pipes were underground and we had to dig to see what was wrong and how we could fix it. As we started digging, they realized that they needed other materials and they went to get it, leaving me alone in the backyard. There was barely any light back there. Why you didn't go with them? The only source of light we had was the moon and one light post a block away from my house. I was pissed off. I mean, how could they leave an eight-year-old boy there by himself in the dark? But I didn't say anything about it. About 10 minutes had gone by since they left and I was wondering what was taking them so long. They were only getting some materials after all. But as I was going to go back inside, I saw something moving really fast at the corner of my eye. I froze. I wanted to run, but I couldn't. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. All I could do was move my eyes. I started to freak out, looking around to see what the hell was running around me. I didn't see anything. It was as if there was nothing there at all. But then I looked to my right, and I saw something that haunts me to this very day. It was a demon, in my opinion. It was so tall, around seven or eight feet tall. Goat? It had long, skinny legs with a really buff body. It also had very long, spiral horns, and his eyes shined in the dark. I still couldn't move. The thing ran by me, looked at me, but it didn't do anything to me. It just looked at me. It could have been a goat or a sheep. I've never seen one so big or one that walks on two legs like a human. It ran, and I hid behind a big tree by my neighbor's house. <sighs> Finally, I could move. I yelled at the top of my lungs while crying hysterically. My dad came running with his shotgun in hand and asked me what was wrong. 
I explained what I saw to him, but he didn't believe me, nor did my mom. But someone did. My neighbor told me that he thought nothing happened to me because I'm a kid. As time passed, I slowly got over it. I moved from that house and moved to New York. My grandparents sold the house and I left that experience in the past. But where was she at the However, whole time? that's not where this story ends. In my sophomore year in high school, I had a nightmare. The thing that I saw that night was in it this time. I could only see its head as it was hiding behind the big tree. He said three words that'll haunt me until my time comes. It said, you can't hide. Yes, I can. I woke up from my nightmare and headed to school. While in school, at around 12.30 p.m., there was an announcement. A classmate of mine had been killed in front of my school by a car without brakes. I turned pale as I thought my nightmare may have something to do with the incident. I was scared and even went home early. I told my parents about it, but this time they took me to a priest and he said he'd give me something in three days. Every single day I had the same nightmare until my priest gave me a blessed cross and I haven't had any nightmares about the thing anymore. However, every night I sleep with the covers over my head. Call me a coward or anything you want, but the thing still hasn't left my mind. Those three words haunt me till this day, making me wonder when I will forget or move on from the thing. About 10 to 12 years ago, I was a drug addict. You know what? After we watch this story, I'm going to start chopping some parts out so it can start running to ads. In Cleveland, Ohio, I usually spent my days smoking, drinking, and I was usually up to no good. I would go with whoever had the drugs, basically. One day, my friend and I were talking with this guy, and he said he had some dope on him and he invited us to his house. It wasn't the first time I've seen him invite women over to his house to smoke and do other drugs. He seemed nice, but I didn't feel comfortable going with him, but I was. Then I saw another friend across the street, so I went over there to her. After that, I went home, and my friend went with him. The next day, his house was surrounded by police and news cameras. I didn't know why, but my friend ended up telling me that when they were in his house, this guy, Anthony, punched her in the back of her head and started to choke her. Then she woke up in a bed. She said next to the bed, she saw a woman's body with no head attached. But she decided not to scream because he was asleep right next to her. She ended up crawling and getting out of the house, literally running out of the house, barely clothed and ended up calling the police. Eventually, they found 11 bodies of 11 different women in and around his house. Who would have known that man was a serial killer? His name was Anthony Sowell. I'm so glad that my other friend caught my attention right before I was going to his house. Who knows, I could have been one of those bodies. A few years back, I rented an apartment from a friend of mine. He had recently bought it and had it completely renovated. He put it up for sale but couldn't find a buyer, so I offered to rent it in the meantime. After moving in, I realized there was something wrong with the lady next door. She was about 45, but looked much older. She would sit up all night listening to Christian radio shows and talking loudly to someone. It got to the point where I couldn't sleep, so I went over to her place and asked her to keep it down. She opened her door and I got a quick peek. Her walks all had crosses painted on them in different colors and words like Jesus and angels scribbled everywhere. The windows were painted black 
letting in no light at all. It was damp, yellow-stained 50-year-old carpets, dog shit and cockroaches everywhere. No dog, though. I asked her to please keep it down. She just looked at me and shut the door. And then she turned up the radio even louder. The next day, I had my girlfriend staying over. I wake up in the middle of the night and see a shadow of a person next to the bed looking at us sleeping. I think I'm hallucinating, as I usually do in the dark when I'm sleepy. But then the shadow starts talking. It's my neighbor, and Punch she's her. holding something in her hand. Even though that she an old lady, but if that happened to me, and you see that weapon that she got in her hand, I will punch her. She broke in during the night, and who knows how long she stood there. You should lock your door at night, she says and walks out. The next morning, I hear someone making strange noises below my bedroom window. It's my neighbor, talking to herself in tongue. She has a plastic bag in her hand, with her rotting, dead dog inside. It's hot as hell outside, and I can smell death from the bag. At this point, I'm scared shitless. She's obviously very insane. You don't say. I go upstairs and knock on another person's door, and ask what the hell is going on. The guy is as scared as me. Apparently she broke into his apartment one evening as well while he was watching TV with his kids. He got up from the couch to get a snack, only to find her behind the couch staring at him, holding a power drill. At this stage, I'm basically shitting myself. I, will be I call the cops and they know all about her. Apparently, she's a violent schizophrenic, and she hasn't taken her meds, but they can't force her or enter her apartment without permission because she owns it. The only thing they can do is get her when she goes outside. I sit up for the next two days, waiting for her to run out of cigarettes. When I hear her leave at 2 a.m. to go across the road to the 7-Eleven, I call the cops. They have three cars and a special van over in less than two minutes. Ooh. They restrain her and throw her in the van and drive off to some institution. And in less than a minute, it's like she was never there. I never see her again, but I still have nightmares about her looking at me in my sleep. Time to chop some parts out. The police arrived quickly. They found him. But what was even more creepy was that he smirked at me when they took him into their car. I called my parents shortly after and told them everything and they came home. I never want to stay home alone again. It creeps me out. I deleted Discord and blocked him before I did. Having an internet boyfriend will haunt me forever. And I will never forget the creepy smirk he gave me. Back when I was 21 years old, I was a strategic firearms commander. This meant that I led a team into dangerous situations that oftentimes involves hostages or civilians who carried guns or other deadly weapons. I had a second-in-command firearms commander working beside me. His name was Callum, and he was my best friend. We always hung out outside of work. While on duty, he would always joke around and make us crack a smile, even when we were dealing with pretty distressful stuff. We once had a case where a man had possession of a firearm, and we were assigned to take care of it. 
Callum seemed particularly eager and jumped out of the van before it even came to a full stop. When the rest of the team reached the scene, the man was already shot. Callum still had the gun in his hand. Soon after, I asked Callum why he was so eager to do it. And then he said he had no specific reason. He was just excited. I believed him because he was my best friend. Later on, when I was looking at the man who was shot, I looked him up on social media and realized that he and Callum added each other on Facebook. Upon further investigation, I realized that there were thousands of messages sent between the two where Callum revealed sensitive information about several operations. I knew that he killed this man on purpose, but I had no way of proving it. He was taken to court and was sentenced to three years in jail for perverting the court of justice. I testified against him and was no longer his friend. When I was 24 years old, I was still on the firearms team. All that happened with Callum was behind me, and I was happy with my life. One night I went home really late after work. As I walked to my apartment, I realized that it was trashed. I called the police and they reported it, but there was not much they could do because I didn't have a CCTV. As I got into bed, I saw that there was a note on my bedside table. All it said was, remember me? I instantly recognized Callum's handwriting. And now that he was out of prison, I thought that he would move on with his life. I was so wrong. This was his revenge. The next day, I went to the underground parking lot and I saw that my windscreen was smashed. It was clear that he wasn't over me testifying against him. Soon after, I also saw him near my apartment. I ran after him, but he ignored me and ran away. I tried calling his old number, but it was no longer in service. Then an envelope was sent through my door, and it contained hundreds of photos of me at work, home, and even out with my girlfriend at clubs and restaurants. These were all taken very recently. The last one, though, was a picture of Callum and I from years ago, and on the other side, written with a big red marker were the words, You're dead. I reported this as stalking and hoped he would end up back in prison. The police had gone to his listed address, but there was no one there. In fact, all of his bags were packed. I knew he was still in the area somewhere, though. One day I was by myself in an unmarked car, and I saw this Toyota Yaris, and it was driving close behind me. It was my gut instinct to get the plate number checked, and I was going to. But then I got a priority one announcement on the radio saying there was a crazy man on a bus who had a knife and stabbed someone. I turned on my sirens and blue lights and headed to the accident. As I got on the bus, he was already arrested, and the ambulance was already there as well. As I was about to leave the bus, I heard a loud bang, and a man on the bus fell down. He was shot through the window by a man who was wearing a black hoodie. He immediately ran. I ran out of the bus and went to the boot of my car. I got my MP5 SF out, which was a large rifle with sniper capabilities. I ran after the suspect and radioed in. They gave me an order of critical shot, which meant I could shoot to kill the suspect. He ran through the town center and went to the left. I was worried about public safety as he had a large rifle as well. I realized instead of running after him, I needed to get on a roof and shoot down. I went to this building that had views of the right and left. It took me five minutes, and I was worried that he would have run away by now. As I got to the roof, I turned my gun to the sniper level. I used the eyepiece to scan, and I saw a man in a black hoodie running. I fired a shot, and he fell to the ground. By the time I got there, more armed policemen came to the area. I was shocked to see Callum. He was the one who followed me in the car behind me, and that shot in the bus was meant for me but he missed. Callum was dead. I felt sad, but also relieved that this was all over. The man shot on the bus survived and I was promoted for my diligent work. I'm still working in the force. Yo. Yo, that was a sad, sad story, bro. That was just scary. That was just scary, bro. Anyway, I'll see you guys maybe on Sunday. I don't know.